So welcome everyone and thank you for coming to what we think is a very historical moment. <laughs> um, our book, A Time to Rise, has taken over 20 years to finish and uh, so we're very happy to finally have this Seattle book launch. Many, many of you have known about our efforts to finish this book, um, and there are many, there are a few of the people here that have contributed, uh, were contributing authors to the book, but there are many more in the audience who wrote stories. Maybe you could have a show of hands of those that wrote stories in the book. There's Velma, Emily, Chris, Chris Melrow, Mike Withy, Terry. Terry Mast. Yes. So, um, so there were a number of people in Seattle that contributed stories. There were a number of people in Seattle who didn't quite finish their stories. And so maybe one day they'll be published on a website or in volume two of KDP Book Stories, <laughs> which hopefully wouldn't take another 20 years to finish. But we feel that A Time to Rise, which is the name of our book, is a very important book, especially for this juncture. It's important because we feel that we have, it helps to leave our legacy in writing about the work that we did as an organization. It also helps for young people to learn about the radical movements that came before them and the experiences and to share our lessons that we learned from that work, as well as we think it's another time to rise because of what's happening in the Philippines. And Renee will talk a little bit about that in his presentation. I'm very glad that Renee Cruz one of the editors of the book was able to join us, and he's going to speak after me. Uh, there were several editors in the course of the 20-some years that took to write this, this book. Um, I, I would say there were like five or six editors, and Renee was important because he's a real writer. He's a real journalist, uh, author, and so he really uh, pushed forth in the final push to get the book done. And so we're glad that he was able to join us. He's, he lives in California. We think that this is an important book as well because oftentimes history of people of color, the history of radical movements are never written by the people who make that history. And so this has been quite an accomplishment of the, the 30 some people that contributed stories in this book because we wrote these stories. And many of these stories are very painful stories that took a long time to finish, but there are also many joyful stories of victories that we were able to accomplish in the years that we carried out our work. Oftentimes, it is the white male who gets to tell our history, and we felt it was important to tell our history while we're still alive, so, uh, you know, <laughs> that's always important to you, right? <laughs> and so I think for many of you who have been involved in radical movements and progressive movements, it's important for you to write your stories as well and to share them with young people as well as your children. Many of the children of KDP members never even knew our histories. So this was important for them as well. As I said, A Time to Rise was a collective effort of over 20 years. Um, and unfortunately, we just lost two of our members of the KDP. Uh, Rick Furukawa died, they actually died two days apart. Rick Furukawa, who was a founding member of the Seattle chapter, passed away June 3rd, and Esther, January 3rd. And Esther Simpson and her family is here tonight, um, passed away just two days after Rick did uh, from cancer. Esther's story is an important part of this book as she was one of, she was a nurse who came to the United States and carried out important work that the KDP did uh, in the healthcare sector. So the stories here, there are many things, human stories that reach into people's personal memories to tell of our struggles. 
in taking up working class struggles and juggling family life, personal commitment, race and gender identity, and some of us were young, like Romy, he's going to read from his story, a youth perspective. <laughs> not that Romy's not still young, but <laughs> he looks young. But what this story, what this book is not, is a definitive history of the KDP with all its line struggles um, and its and more in-depth stories, ideological developments. So we leave that for another book and for some of us to write. Maybe Renee will write that book. <laughs> so just a little bit about, because I think there are some people here that don't know who the KDP, the KDP or the English name for the KDP was the Union of Democratic Filipinos. And we were founded in 1973 as a radical organization committed to social change. And we, had, we were an unusual group because we were made up of both Filipino Americans, Filipino immigrants, some Filipino immigrants and nationals who came to this country out of exile because of the U.S. Marcos dictatorship. Um, we had a dual program of supporting the National Democratic Revolution in the Philippines and the most immediate um, strategy we had for that work was to overthrow and to end the U.S. Marcos dictatorship and to end the U.S. support of that dictatorship, which was finally done in 1986 as a result of people's power. The second part of our work was a socialist program in the United States organizing in the Filipino community. The Filipino community today is the second largest immigrant community uh, in, in the country next to the Chinese Americans. But it's still a very small community uh, so it is unusual that a radical organization like the KDP formed and was able to, we think, accomplish uh, a lot of political work in organizing um, that won concrete victories. Uh, as part of that socialist program, we carried out many democratic rights struggles, including leading in the international hotel struggle to save housing in uh, San Francisco, we fought for uh, the rights of um, uh, nurses and doctors who immigrated to this country for fair licensure. We also did uh, youth organizing. We, we actually organized youth here in the International District uh, to take up the Philippine struggle as well as to fight for youth rights. And so we, we existed actually until about 1986 but continued to have a newspaper until 1990, in which Renee was the editor of the newspaper. So for those years, um, we had chapters in all of the major cities that there were Filipino communities. Uh, there, were, there were about 10 chapters, Hawaii, we actually had a chapter in Guam at one point, Seattle, San Francisco, Oakland, LA, San Diego, Chicago, New York, Washington, DC. And we also had um, the International Association of Filipino Patriots in Toronto, Montreal, and Vancouver. So we were not, though, in terms of numbers, very large organization, although I'm sure the FBI and the CIA thought we were in the thousands. But I, I don't think we were really over 250 people. And so, uh, but as I said, we were at every major front and, and struggle that was um, that confronted the Filipino community. The Seattle chapter was the most unusual chapter and the largest chapter, numbering in probably about 35 or 36 members. But it was a multiracial chapter. It had, uh, it was actually started by Dale Borgeson, a Swedish, uh, a man of Swedish descent. <laughs> he was sent by the KDP National to, uh, um, to organize the Seattle chapter. And he found Selmy Domingo and Angel Doniego at the University of Washington. Took him a long time to tackle those guys and form the KDP chapter. Uh, David Della, myself, were uh, founding members. And uh, Sherry Wu, who's in the back. And Elaine Coe, who, uh, 
who also who runs this place was also a member a founding member but um, there were Japan so there was Dale Borgeson who founded the chapter Japanese Americans Chinese Americans uh, multiracial folks and so uh, many of the other Asians parading as if they were Filipinos <laughs> <laughs> Wanna be. All right. Wanna be. Andy Mizuki uh, we used to call him Andy Santos so, and oftentimes they were uh, tasked to sell the Anka Tupuna newspaper and to organize as well in the um, Filipino community. But one of the major uh, strongholds of our work was here in the International District as we uh, fought to save this area as a neighborhood for the Asian community. Today that fight continues as gentrification <laughs> and uh, continues to develop in the International District. So what we were going to do today is uh, have Renee speak. Renee wrote uh, one of the uh, introductions to the book and uh, then we're gonna have a few readings by the three up here um, and uh, we had a variety of meetings and then we were gonna open it up for Q&A, all right? Hello, um, I'm Rene Celia Cruz, uh, a resident of San Francisco, uh, and I was a founding member of the Union of Democratic Filipinos in 1973 in Santa Cruz, California, originally uh, a member of the New York chapter until I moved to San Francisco in 1980. Uh, the question perhaps for, especially for those of the younger persuasion, is that, was there, what, what are we talking about? The revolutionary organization of Filipinos existed in the United States. I mean, a socialist, leftist kind of organization. And the answer is yes, because the, the United States was very, a very different place then. The world was very different then. Um, it might be useful to recall, step back and recall, that the Second World War not only defeated internationally defeated fascism, but also unleashed a powerful current of national liberation movements throughout the world. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> in the decades following the Second World War, uh, there was the Korean War, the Hook Balahap Rebellion in the 50s in the Philippines, the Vietnam War, anti-colonial uh, movements in Africa, in Latin America, the revolution in Cuba, youth rebellions in the Western uh, countries as baby boomers came of age. Uh, in the Philippines, there was the resurgence of nationalism and the, the rebirth of a uh, liberation movement, uh, which was responded to eventually by the Marcos dictatorship supported by the United States. In the United States, there was the anti-war movement, uh, civil rights movement, and the rise of the new left, uh, involving uh, members of the baby boom or post-war generation. So that the situation was such that it seemed possible at that time that a new world could be born within the lifetime of the baby boom generation. So that people, including members of the KDP, invested their lives into the movement for change, both in the United States and internationally. So you had these students for democratic, democratic society, you had pre-party formations, uh, Marxist parties, and uh, so there was the Black Panthers in the African-American community, the Brown Berets, in the Mexican-American community, the young lords among the Puerto Ricans, and in the Filipino community, there was the KDP. We had no guns, we had no uniforms, but we had the same, the same radical politics responding to the situation that we lived in. That's why we call the book A Time to Rise. Uh, the, uh, KDP's formation signified the rebellion of the Filipino baby boomers, both Filipino-American 
and Philippine born. Uh, it signified uh, the rebellion against the conservatism in their own community that was formed by the McCarthy era and the sense of gratitude by Filipinos for the American liberation of the Philippines against Japanese fascism. So that you had a community that was fairly uh, conservative, that didn't want to so-called bite the hands that fed it. Uh, but the younger generation, because of their experience growing up as non-whites uh, in a racialized society, uh, rebelled against that. That partly contributed to the formation of the KDP. Uh, so now what we have, oh, but, uh, but that time and that movement for change began to ebb, uh, I would say by the 80s. The uh, Reagan counter-revolution had taken place. Uh, after the victories of the National Liberation Movements, uh, uh, the Cold War uh, uh, existed, and with the uh, dissolution or the failure of uh, socialism that existed then in the Soviet bloc, uh, the movement internationally entered a period of ebb. And no one exactly knows and no one can foretell today when another flow will come. Uh, that was similar to the to the the time that we we operated in. So we find ourselves uh, contemplating whether we going to take up the struggle again. Because here in the United States, uh, hmm, it seems to be a time to rise again. <laughs> uh, uh, some of us are already becoming active in the fight back against the Trump uh, administration, which has revived and revitalized uh, forces of reaction and made more visible the base of fascism in the United States. And in the Philippines, you know, the liberal democratic uh, government or system that we reestablished after the overthrow of the Marcos regime, that system had survived several military coup attempts by the right, the right wing. But we're not sure whether it's going to survive the current administration, uh, which is an authoritarian tendency that has a popular base. Uh, it's really backward, and it's already going on a campaign of attempts to repress uh, labor, repress uh, the independent media, and to uh, monopolize political power. So again, that's another point where we begin contemplating whether we need to be active again. So I think uh, that is a, an open question. A lot of it depends on our how far our wobbly knees and <laughs> eyesight will take us, and in what form, uh, in what form that participation will, will take, whether it's going to be another KDP, who knows. But that's where we are at this point. As, uh, if we want to look at the continuity of what this book uh, represents uh, to today. Thank you. So our first reading is going to be done by Romy Garcia. Um, he is, uh, his, his story is called How My Life Changed. He was in the, he was recruited into the San Francisco chapter. And his story is in part one called Beginnings, in which there are a collection of stories, uh, different stories of how people got recruited into the KDP. So Romy. Hello, hello. Hi, hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. All right. Good to see so many smiling faces today. <laughs> so I, I'd like to begin. There, actually, uh, I had mentioned to Cindy that 
I was actually going to share my, my writing about uh, Manu Mario, who was a member of the uh, San Francisco KDP chapter. But so I'm going to uh, improvise a bit and uh, share a little bit about because she said, use perspective, right? So, I'm gonna, so I do what uh, Cindy says. So first is that uh, prior to meeting up with KDP, I actually was initially in, uh, politicized at an alternative high school and met a lot of uh, progressive socialists. And actually, the principal of that um, high school was a member of the Communist Party, USA. And so right after school, immediately, I came across the, what they call the Philippine National Day, and that is the, the version of the uh, independence to, uh, for uh, the Philippines to um, break away historically from uh, the colonial uh, rule. And so what happened is that <clears throat> at that meeting, there were many, many different uh, people that was at the, meet, at the uh, school, at the uh, PND, and at that time, I was just kind of um, not knowing really what to do, and this happened literally a week after I got out of high school. And so <clears throat> one of the things, uh, and I'll just start here now, is that uh, I'll, I'll uh, so here's the quote on my um, first part here. I said, <clears throat> I write, um, the KDP activist level of revolutionary commitment was astounding to me. They seemed to have the ability to attend all night marathon meetings and then go to work the next morning. Well, I go, wow. It was, it was difficult to picture myself going to meetings almost every day and night and not spending time socializing with my friends. I wasn't sure I could make such a commitment since I was just a reformed gang member who had previously experienced only a little bit of politics in my last year of high school. However, the folks in the KDP assured me that joining KDP, that the work, that the work at times was exhaust, ex exhausting, and at times but the commitment was tremendous. So there were many individuals that, that I met at the SF chapter, and one of the ones who uh, I would like to share briefly with is uh, Mami Ma Mario. So I'd like to uh, start here. Quote, um, one person who remains sharp and clear in my memory is Mang Mario Hermoso. Mang or Manong signifies a respect for the elder, older male. He had already been a member of uh, a few years when I joined the San Francisco chapter of the KDP. When I first met him at Wilma's house, he was 70, 77 uh, years old. Mario was a shade less than medium height with a compact build and shape like a thick box. You got the impression that he must have been a very strong, must have been very strong in his younger days. His eyesight was quickly, was going quickly. So when he, <clears throat> when he come close to, you, to address you, you see with a twinkle in his eye and a soft, gentle voice, almost a whisper. He was a gracious and polite in a very Filipino way. But his hands were strong and his fingers were knotted from years and years of hard manual work. His brown skin was no longer taunt against his face but showed the many lines of a man who had aged beautifully. He was from the Visayas, Philippines, and he came to America as a young man in the late 20s. He did what most Filipinos did back then. He worked in the fields, went to the cannery, Alaskan canneries, did the kitchen work in the cities, and the like. But Mario was also very different. He was one of the few Filipinos of his generation in the United States to become a Marxist and a revolutionary. He and Mang Pablo, who also joined the KDP, were the Communist Party of the USA in the late 1930s. <clears throat> Mario and I teamed up to distribute the Taliba which is the, our, our regular bulletin about what was happening in the Philippines, and sell the Ankatipunan uh, newspaper, which I, I don't know if we have a copy of that, but uh, that was our uh, KDP um, newspaper. And we were selling those in front of um, St. Patrick's uh, Church on Sunday mornings. Sometimes I would pick him up at the Vincent Hotel, other times he'd make his way down to the church on his own. After we'd finished our, quote, propaganda assignment, end quote, 
We'd often go to McDonald's to grab a bite to eat. He would talk to me about many things related to philosophy, political economy, and socialism, deep issues that I was just beginning to understand. He had confidence in my ability to think, and he showed respect and patience for my opinions, even when I knew they were muddled and confused. <laughs> like many other KDP activists, he, <clears throat> I felt like I had a, a special relation with Mario, Mang Mario. Mario had a way of making everyone feel, feel this way, which was important because Mario was our link to the past. He would inspire us on a regular basis. He especially used one metaphor, and, and I'll close with this. You know, he'd say, you may have gas and pistons and rods in your car, but all these things don't matter unless the spark plug gives off the spark. That's the KDP's role, to be the spark plug, spark for change in the Filipino community, the spark to keep moving forward. Thank you. So our second reading is from David Della. One of the uh, largest chapters and most significant chapters in the book is, is about the struggle for justice in the murders of Selmy Domingo and Jean Bernis who were killed at the orders of the Marcos regime. That struggle, uh, which continues today, um, but we were able to win a multi-million dollar uh, verdict in the case a landmark case, the first time a foreign dictator has ever been held responsible for murders of U.S. citizens. David also has... <laughs> David has two stories in the book. One in the beginnings, along with Romy's, called A Little Red Book. You know what Little Red Book that is, right? Mao Tse Tong book. We don't read that anymore. <laughs> And David's going to uh, read a story uh, in this section about the Committee for Justice for Domingo and Baroness and the struggle for justice in the murders. And it's called A Day I'll Live With for the Rest of My Life. Thank you, Cindy. Anyway, uh, welcome everyone here. And so as Cindy mentioned, um, I was one of the founding members, along with Cindy and others, of the Seattle chapter of the KDP. Uh, what brought me here uh, was the Asian identity movement, working on different issues in our schools and our community with regards to discrimination issues and uh, preserving this community here in the international district. Um, so uh, when Dale Borgeson came around to recruit people, he started having parties because we all like to party. And, uh, so he invited us to a party, a drinking party at his house. And we went there and said, what's all this about? And we started talking about the Philippines, right? And so I was on my way up to Alaska uh, in, in 1974. And um, as I was getting onto the bus to go to the airport to go to Alaska to work in the canneries, Angel Don Diego handed me this little red book, uh, Philippine Society and Revolution. And he said, brother, read this when you're up there. And tell me what you think. Right? So I, ha I have the story in, in, in the first story about what that was. Anyway, the result of that was, was for me to join the chapter when I returned from Alaska. And um, uh, in the KDP, I uh, worked on student organizing, community organizing, and eventually got into the labor team uh, uh, in uh, helping to reform Local 37 ILWU, the Canary Workers Union. And so the murders of Selmy, Domingo, and Jean Vernis on June 1, 1981 was both a defining and a tragic moment for our movement and the KDP uh, and the anti-Marcos movement. And um, it was such because uh, that incident alone defined really what we were about. And that incident alone uh, provided the gravity and the seriousness of the work that we were doing. And really, it was really about providing the intersection between the brutalities of the Marcos dictatorship and what was going on here in, in America, especially with regards to workers' rights. And if you read in the books and the other stories, there was a resolution that came out of ILWU that looked for um, setting up an investigating team to link up the struggles of um, 
what was going on in the Philippines in, uh, in their unions there that was being cracked down by the Marcos dictatorship and the U.S. labor movement. And that became very dangerous to the Marcos dictatorship. So as Cindy, Cindy mentioned, their murders was not, uh, was not a routine uh, union reform murder. The way it was done was a message to the movement that um, you're getting too close. You're getting too close to the source. And so we had a decision to make right away uh, was whether we're going to cower from that type of incident or we're going to move forward. We chose to move forward. So in a lot of ways, um, uh, what the story I want to read is the, is the day of the murders because I was late for a meeting on that day. Uh, if I was on time, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you to talk. But it really defined not only our movement, but personally it defined who I am and, and, and what um, type of work I was going to be dedicated to do for the rest of my life. So I'll, I'll read the expert, uh, excerpt from my... Here it is. I worked, um, I, I was working at another job downtown on my way down to the union hall to meet with Selmy and Jean. I worked right up to 4.35 p.m. before I realized that I was going to be late for the meeting that I have uh, to listen to Se uh, to listen to Selmy ribbing me all night for being late on vacillating on taking up the tasks needed to coordinate the Philippine National Day this year. <laughs> I worked downtown less than a mile from the Union Hall. Uh, I could have walked but had my car that day. I was driving south on 2nd Avenue when I saw fire trucks suddenly pull up in front of the Union Hall on South Main Street and an ambulance leaving with the si uh, siren blaring and large, the lights flashing. Oh my God, was the Union Hall on fire? As I drove past the intersection on 2nd and Main, I could see to my left was Salmi's Monte Carlo parked in its usual parking space. I cautiously proceeded around the corner and parked just behind the Union Hall and got out and walked uh, towards the building. A fire truck and police cruiser were parked outside and I saw a firefighter in full gear walking out of the door. I ran up and asked if there was a fire. He said there was no fire but a shooting had occurred and one man was dead inside and another one had been taken to Harborview Hospital. He showed me the small pool of blood on the sidewalk in front of the door. He showed me the small, uh, uh, as if to prove that there had in fact been a shooting. I asked about Selmy. He said he didn't know who Selmy was, but there was a dead man inside the union offices. I told him I was on the executive board of the union and that I wanted to go inside. The firefighter asked if I could help identify the dead man. Hesitantly, I said I would try and asked again about Selmy. Again, he told me he didn't know who Selmy was. The firefighter went in and brought out a, a policeman to escort me in and identify whoever was dead. As I walked to the, behind the police officer, I was shaking. Inside, I saw another union member, Matt Cowling. He told me it was Jean who was dead on the floor. I walked into the office area and saw the most hideous sight I've ever seen. Jean was lying on the floor with blood splattered up from his torso over his face. His eyes were still open with an empty dead look. Oh God, I thought I was going to throw up. I turned and bolted out of the hall. Waiting out, uh, wanted to get outside, hoping to get, hoping that none of this was really happening. Uh, my adrenaline took over. I asked the police officer who had followed me out where Selmy was. He interrupted, asking if I could positively identify the dead man. I said, "Yes, he is my friend and roommate." I, I told the cop that I'd been, suppo I was supposed to come here and meet with Selmy and Jean. He told me that the other man was uh, pretty badly shot and was being taken to Harborview Hospital. I asked for a ride to the hospital. He said I could go out, uh, get one as soon as they finished up a few things. I ran across the street to Swanee's, which was a bar right across the street from the Union Hall, a sports bar, and got to a telephone to call someone. I had to tell someone that something awful had just happened. I was numb. I couldn't cry, scream, nothing. I called Lenny Marin's house. Lenny, uh, Lenny had been transferred to the KDP from New York's chapter uh, to help us with our work here. Lenny answered the phone and I just gushed out the words that there had been a shooting at the Union Hall and Jean was dead and Selmy was at the hospital. Lenny started crying loudly while simultaneously trying to tell her partner, Mila de Guzman, 
what had happened. Before long, I heard them both crying. I was still too numb to cry. Lenny told me to go to the hospital to check on Selmy and that she would call Bruce Oxenia and others in San Francisco. So um, what followed that was um, I went to the hospital to check on Selmy. He had been through a couple of surgeries but was still alive. And um, he passed away 24 hours later. But uh, this is just to say that um, uh, we um, had the resolve to um, uh, to go in the next day to continue to work with Selmy and Jean, despite what had happened. And it really was the, a work that the KDP did for many years that strengthened our resolve, but also strengthened the movement to not only uh, find out what was truly behind the murders, but also to build the movement uh, for justice for the murders. This, that section is called The Test of Fire, and there are other stories written. Uh, Alonzo Sasson, who is part of the Local 37 team, wrote, wrote a very personal story about his uh, recollections of Jean Varenas. And then Dale Borgeson wrote a story called The Terrible Blow, which is also a personal story of how he met Salmi Domingo and the work that he did. Emily. Emily Van Bronckhurst, who's here today, wrote Initiation from Hell, which is how she got recruited into the uh, Alaska Cannery Workers' uh, work in Local 37, um, as well as Terry Mast, who wrote a story, We Had Already Lost Too Much to Turn Back, the struggle to take complete control of the union after Salmi and Jean were assassinated. And then Mike Withy has a story called A Night in Camelot about when we went to the Philippines uh, after the overthrow of the Marcos regime uh, to get justice for Salmi and to get the cooperation of, of the Philippine government. And one of my favorite stories, A Memory of Strong Women, which was written by Lillian Galado uh, about when she was asked to transfer to Seattle from the Bay Area to help bolster the work here in the Committee for Justice and the and the, the KDP chapter. And I also have a story called Long Road to Justice, which spans the, the whole decade that we were struggling for justice. And lastly, our friend Jim Douglas, who passed away last year, um, wrote a story called Defeating the Marcoses in a Court of Law. So it's a very, it's probably the, one of the most comprehensive, uh, the first comprehensive writings about the murders. And uh, it was written, uh, begun at a retreat that we all went to in Whidbey Island. Uh, the Keith family has a, a, a cabin there and we went there to write our stories. And it was very difficult, it was the first time and it was several years after the murders. So our next reading will be read by Odette Polentan, uh, a story that was written by her daughter when she was very young. I just want to say a few words about Odette. Odette uh, wrote a story called Working the Corridors of Power, but she won't be reading from that story. She'll be reading her daughter's story. Uh, Odette um, was an activist at a very young age in the Philippines at 14, right? <laughs> And then she immigrated to the United States because her mother said, you better come here now <laughs> during the, the Marcos regime. She uh, is famous for her work as being one of the anchors to the Congressional Task Force, which was based in Washington, D.C., which lobbied Congress to end support for the dictatorship, a very successful lobbying job, along with other comrades uh, in, in the chapter there. So um, in 19, 1992, she returned to get her Bachelor of Arts and then finally got her law degree in 1995. So she's going to read from C9 story. So as a, as a mother and a parent, uh, and being an activist, those are very difficult uh, times because uh, as I think Romy alluded to, the KDP work was very demanding. We were in meetings all the time. Um, it was really our priority, you know, um, our life's priority and purpose. And to raise a family at the same time was very challenging. But I, my hope then was when I was raising my daughter, Silahis, 
um, was that she wouldn't rebel and, and reject my values. But in fact, it was so gratifying when the KDP uh, made the call asking for articles. And I asked her, hey, would you be interested to write an article uh, from the perspective of growing up in the KDP family? She said, sure. But I was scared to ask her, well, what are you gonna write? <laughs> <laughs> but I was so pleasantly surprised when I read the draft uh, that Um, she was very proud of the KDP, very proud of, of what I had shared, and also her dad, right? Because Ding at the time was also active in the KDP, and she really internalized those values. So it's entitled Scooby-Doo, Growing Up with the KDP. Scooby-Doo was her favorite cartoon character, so um, I don't know the connection. <laughs> Why she said Scooby-Doo? <laughs> um, okay. Nasan si mommy. That means where's my mom? I remember demanding of my dad always uh, inquiring about my mom's whereabouts. Your mom is at the meeting, he would always reply, meeting, meeting. Such a strange word, yet already part of my two-year-old vocabulary. She was very verbal, as you can see in her description. I learned that word almost at the same time as I did inom, which is to drink, or matulog, which is to sleep. I would often accompany my parents to these strange gatherings they, the grown-ups, would assign me tasks to keep my restlessness under some degree of control. At the tender age of four, I mastered the art of envelope stuffing. <laughs> this is obviously the time before emails. I, I would make a game of my task, turning those important leaflets and flyers into paper airplanes. Despite all the chaos I caused at meetings, I actively participated in the events my parents helped organize. I attended everything my parents did. I picketed, we lived in DC at the time, so I picketed in front of the White House, cheered on my Tito John Melegrito as he led many of our rallies, helped at fundraisers, and even sang for President Corazon Aquino when she visited the United States after the fall of Marcos. To me, these things were part of everyday life. Having a child's outlook on my parents' causes, I figured that they were always right. I sensed the seriousness of the battles fought, but never fully grasped their entirety. To me, everything resembled the plot of my Saturday morning cartoon, Scooby-Doo. There was only one conflict, the good guy versus the bad guy. If you were the good guy, which I thought I was, you could do anything you wanted, and the bad guy, for example, Marcos and Ronald Reagan, could do no nothing to hurt you. So acting on instinct, I drew, quote, no Marcos, in quote, and, quote, no Reagan, in quote, signs. I wish I brought those, because I still kept them. I taped them on our doors and picketed by myself on our front lawn. <laughs> I grew up always voicing my opinions and later continued to act on them. Most parts of radical politics were second nature to me. So you can imagine my surprise when I entered Meeker Junior High in Kent, Washington. We moved back here in Seattle, a suburb of Seattle. People in Kent lived in a suburban bubble. Most of my classmates were like, duh, huh, politics? They seem so different from me. The, their biggest concern uh, had, I'm sorry, the biggest concern many of my friends had was what to wear on Friday nights. Most of them hadn't even thought about the kind of things I had already done. I remember our, often thinking, thank God I'm not that ignorant. <laughs> A little arrogant, but. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, um, it was very clear because I I'll quote in here because she there's a paragraph here where she's discussing with with her boyfriend at the time, but it's it's very gratifying to read this part. Um, um, he she says. I had practically dedicated my life to the principles of nonviolence, equality, and civil rights. I fought for peace and justice. I learned that everybody has a struggle, and there are many shades of gray between the black and white I saw innocently as a child. Growing up with the KDP has taught me many lessons I use in life. I have seen the world from many different perspectives. I know about my parents' struggles that open doors for my generation. By teaching me their beliefs and causes, my parents have given me the best gift possible at 15. I had knowledge and an understanding most of my friends did not. I thank my parents for these experiences and gifts. Unfortunately, unfortunately she passed 10 years ago in 2008, so. So the last story um, that I'm going to read is not from my stories, but uh, it's the favorite story in the, in the book that I have. Uh, and it was written by Edwin Batumbakal. It's one of the last stories, and it's called No Regrets. And I think for many of us who were um, active or continue to be active, um, as myself, um, we continually think about is the work that we're doing, is the work that we've done in the past, is the sacrifices we made, is it, is it, and was it worth it? So Edwin uh, was a student activist while studying at De La Salle University, Manila in the late 1970s. He uh, worked in the KDP chapters in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And like other activists, Edwin eventually went back to school where he studied to become a social worker. He now works for San Francisco County and continues to be active in supporting pro-democracy efforts in the Philippines and oftentimes single-handedly organizes events like he's doing next week where there are two young people coming from the Philippines from the Akbayan party. So his, uh, <laughs> again, no regrets. Why was I ever drawn into the movement? Answering this question is important because I now look back at how my life diverged from those of my schoolmates and friends. Their current lives of material success and power might have also been mine if I had walked the path they did especially, since I, like them, was privileged with the best education money could buy in the Philippines. I seek